ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Adam Miller. We got the crowd a little fired up already. Thanks, Garrison. We are looking forward to an amazing couple of days. We already kicked it off last night. We had a great partner summit yesterday, great day with the analysts, and we're looking forward to two amazing days. We really want to build on your journey with us. We want to build on an exceptional experience. And so today, what I really want to talk about is the Cornerstone experience. The experience that all of you have with us in many different ways. There's the experience for the employee, how they're trying to realize their potential, the experience of the manager and how the manager is interacting with their employees, helping them to build their careers, helping them to be successful. It's the experience of executives trying to make the right decisions about how to operate the business and continue to grow the organization. But it's also the experience of recruiters who are trying to bring in the best people to the organization. The experience of many of you who are administrators who are working to ensure that you're getting the most out of working with Cornerstone and of course, it's the experience of the HR team itself and how they're getting their jobs to make the organization successful. And really all this is about helping you to realize your potential, whether we're talking about your organization, your company, or your people. How do we make you most successful in realizing your potential. So I really want to talk about the Cornerstone experience and all those different dimensions. But to do that, I want to set the stage. I want to talk a little bit about the future. Well, if you're a science fiction fan, you know that the assumption has always been that in the future, the world will be taken over by robots. There's all different kinds of robots that take over the world, but it's always a robot that takes over the world. Well, that's actually not what's occurred because we're already living in the future that many of those writers were talking about. And we've already seen the world get taken over, but it's not taken over by robots, fortunately. No, it's something a little less obvious to see. The world has been taken over by software. Software has eaten the world and continues to do so on a daily basis. And we see this in so many different aspects of our lives. There was just a report that came out that over the next few years, 25% of all of the malls in America will close. 25% of all malls. That might include your hometown. Why? Well, we all know the answer. Amazon. You're shopping at Amazon. You're not going to the mall. You might be going to the mall to browse, but you're not actually buying anything there. It's being shipped to you by a drone dropping a carton off at your front door or if you're at my house, dropping a lot of cartons off at your front door. You know, it used to be that if you were in a big enough city, these yellow cars would come. If you stood out in the rain and waved your umbrella and jumped up and down and walked far enough up the street that you cut off the other person, <laughs> the ones laughing live in New York. So <laughs> the, that, Day, those days are over, right? Uber and Lyft are now the way that we get transportation. You could do it while you're still indoors. And the car will be waiting for you outside. You know when it shows up. And what might be closer to home for 
HR people, we used to get together and meet. We used to actually go to the office, people would fly in, you'd have these meetings, you'd bring in food. Not anymore. WebEx, live meeting, people are doing this stuff through Skype. They're meeting, but they're meeting virtually. And typically in those meetings, you only know if the person is wearing an appropriate shirt. <laughs> I've done those interviews too. <laughs> My kids are always very confused at how I'm dressed. <laughs> so software is eating the world, but what, what is driving that? What is changing now? It's become an advantage, right? The advantage is this next phase of personalization. Everything is personalized now. The reason we're shopping online much more than we shopped online 10 years ago, certainly more than 20 years ago, is because it's more personalized. When we have that experience, it feels like they know what we want. Sometimes it's a little scary, right? They know what we want before we even know what we want. And whether it's our communications, whether it's trying to pick a restaurant, right? It knows exactly where you are. So I travel a lot. A lot of times we're trying to figure out where to eat. When I get to a city, pull out Yelp. You say, buy my location. It'll tell you all the good places to go eat right there. It's personalized. It's built for you. It's showing you exactly what you need to know. And in many ways, this kind of personalization, which is now everywhere, is the next evolution of software. Right? The first phase, which goes back a couple of decades, was automation. We were automating things that we were doing manually, whether it was financial record keeping, or supply chain management, or basic HR transactions. We were automating things. Then came the wave of consumerization. This was really brought to us by Apple and the iPhone, where everything started to look beautiful at home, and then soon thereafter at the office. All the software started to look much better. It was easier to use. It was more intuitive and in some ways, beautiful. Now we're in the age of personalization where everything that you see is personalized for you. It's more and more specific to what you need, what you want. And over time, we're gonna see more and more robotics. It's already started, but it's too late for them to take over the world because the software already did it. And a lot of this is driven by artificial intelligence. And advances in machine learning and deep thinking have improved the way we do artificial intelligence, which influences a lot of these things I'm talking about. So what this really boils down to is the idea of innovation. And we know quite a bit about innovation. We've been innovating at Cornerstone for quite a while. So it started back at the internet boom in 99 when we first started the company. And by 2001, we were already building out cloud computing, well in advance of most of the world. In fact, it wasn't even called cloud computing at the time. And then by 2005 had already built out not just learning management, but fully integrated talent management. Soon thereafter, adding components like enterprise social networking to what we were doing. And then realizing it wasn't just about the software, but also the service. And so working on the client success framework and this idea of client success management is now so commonplace 
that Kirsten was just speaking at a conference on client success management with thousands of attendees. We have since then understood this shift to consumerization, making sure that all the software looked beautiful, and then this idea of prescriptive talent management, right? getting more and more personalized in everything we do. So there's been a lot of innovation. And with that innovation came a lot of enhancements to the Cornerstone platform, a lot of new products, a lot of new features. And we realized at the end of, the, of last year that we actually arguably had too many different products. It was starting to get very, very confusing. And we recognized it was getting confusing for our clients. It was certainly getting confusing for our partners. And it was even getting a little confusing internally. There were just too many different products, dozens of products that we were talking about. And so we decided at the beginning of this year, understanding that simplicity matters, we decided to simplify what we were doing. To really focus not on dozens of different products, but really reframe the conversation and start talking about four product suites instead of many different products. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. These four product suites, learning, performance, recruiting, and HR, really simplifying what we're offering and at the same time allowing us to focus on making the innovations that make each of those areas really important. Moving from being tactical about how those pieces work to becoming very strategic about how to make each of those components really successful in your organization. And I want to start where we started as a business. And we started in learning. So today, Cornerstone Learning is the most widespread learning platform out there in the world. And we've been helping many of you and many of our other clients build a culture of learning and development. And that includes all different modalities of training. That includes all different ways of helping a person get developed. From simple online classes to instructor-led training sessions to virtual programs with social collaboration and cohorts, really managing the entire training and development process at an organization. And we're doing this at scale. Last year, we delivered 360 million registrations through the system. 360 million courses taken through Cornerstone. And lest we become concerned that all of this screen time is bad for us and our brains are turning to mush from watching too much television. It's somewhat comforting to know that last year we delivered 1.3 billion hours of training that were viewed on Cornerstone. So we're talking about something that's reached true global scale. And along this journey, we've seen a major evolution in workplace learning. Right? It's changed over time. When I started the company, almost everybody was still getting trained in a the classroom. There were very, very few organizations that were training anybody online, whether we're talking about online classes or virtual training. Of course, all that changed with the advent of e-learning. And over time, that morphed into blended learning, 
where people were combining the best of both worlds, the best aspects of training in the classroom, but shortening the, the time and lowering the cost of those programs by leveraging the power of online training. And then over time, that morphed into social learning, being able to do these very interesting, maybe extensive programs online with a virtual cohort of people going through the program together, facilitated by an expert or by somebody in L&D that was training on leadership development or other areas. And then more recently, you had this idea of crowdsourced learning. Whether it was user-generated content or prosumer creation of online training. But all those evolutions created opportunities for everybody in this room. It created opportunities to take training and development to the next level. And that evolution hasn't ended. The evolution's continued. And we're moving to the next stage of that evolution. And it has to do with the mindset of learning. And I strongly believe that a lot of this is influenced by the rise of millennials in the workplace and their expectations about their own career development. And so you've had this shift from training to learning. You've also had a shift from the employer being responsible for development of the employee to the employee being responsible for their own development. We've also seen training move from being a one-time or periodic activity to help somebody in a brand new job or to facilitate meeting of compliance requirements to a very different experience where Training is ongoing. It's a lifelong process. And it's moved from being formal to much of the training being informal. So what's driving all that? Well, part of it's the millennials. Part of it's the changes in what's available in the training world. And part of it is a shift in consumer expectations. But part of it also is that shift in technology that we're talking about, where technology has taken over so many aspects of society and many aspects of our jobs. So the need to train on a lifelong basis is very real. It's not just about millennials expecting to have five to seven careers during their lifetime and therefore needing to continuously develop but also the idea that in five to 10 years, your job is gonna be different. And you're gonna to need to be upskilled or reskilled to do that job that exists five or 10 years from now. So it's no longer optional. You have to keep training. You have to keep learning. But like I said, it's also influenced by consumer trends. Right, the way we consume media now is very different than it used to be. And there's a lot of media out there to consume. So what's changed? Well, if you think about it, we've had a dramatic shift in the way people consume video over the last five years. And that shift has resulted in the establishment of a metaphor for how we consume video, how we find it, and how we consume it. And that metaphor is really driven by Netflix. Now there are many other video-based services out there, but all of them have adopted the Netflix approach, that metaphor of how people are finding and consuming video. The same thing's happened on the audio side. If you think about how you listen to music now, it's very different than certainly 10 years ago, but even two or three years ago. 
very different today. We started out buying albums, and then that shifted to 8-tracks and cassettes, and then CDs. But all that was basically the same thing. We were buying them packaged together. And then with iTunes, we started buying individual songs. You could go just with the hits. But even that's gone now. The rise of music services like Spotify, the way we're consuming audio is completely different. We sign up for a subscription service. We don't pay for the individual songs or albums. We just pay the subscription. And we have access to an unlimited catalog of music. And that catalog is somewhat overwhelming, so we rely on other people curating it for us. Well, the next evolution of learning is clearly going to be influenced by these changes in the way we consume media. It changes the way we think about searching and discovering, training. It changes our expectations about how personalized the experience is for us. We expect to be able to rely on our peers to help us figure out what to, what to take, what to do. And we expect to get credit for anything we're watching, anything we're doing, anything that we're learning. So how have these two things really influenced our thinking? Well, we believe that discovery of learning is going to be very much like Netflix. The same experience you have to discover what to watch next. Now this is probably not a good example because this is actually my Netflix account. <laughs> and what you'll see is that personalization doesn't always work perfectly, right? Machine learning doesn't always work perfectly. So we, we are very self-aware that AI, while has enormous potential, has not fully achieved its potential yet. Because, as everyone knows, it would be very odd that you're watching Liv and Maddie and Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> I don't know what that says about the person. Unless it was actually two different people sharing the same account. In our case, it's five people sharing the same account, and the kids are watching Liv and Maddie, and I'm watching Sons of Anarchy, and my wife and I are watching House of Cards. So it's a very mixed experience, but interestingly, even with that confusing setup, the recommendation still makes sense for the family. And finding things actually is quite easy. And the personalization's everywhere. So popular on Netflix doesn't mean popular for the whole world. Those shows would never show up. If you looked at the most popular around the world, it's popular relative to what we're interested in. And so we expect learning to be exactly the same way. And so that's why we're introducing a new learning experience platform for what we do. That's going to be part of Cornerstone Learning going forward. And this is following the exact same approach that Netflix takes in Discovery. Now this has been a long journey for us. It started with the acquisition of a machine learning platform company two and a half years ago. And then building out the big data capabilities that allow us to personalize. And leveraging all the improvements we've made on the administrative side of learning management to enable personalization for the employee. And as you can imagine, when we talk about personalizing for the employee, we're talking about personalizing on all different dimensions. Understanding their attributes, understanding their interests, understanding their position and what makes sense for an employee in that position. So, in effect, 
taking that consumer experience and applying it to the workplace. And just like Netflix has a very consistent experience, whether you're browsing for something or you're searching because you know something specific you want to see, we are reconciling the very different experiences that exist in Cornerstone today between searching and browsing. And so the search will effectively be very similar to the browse. The tile view that we've all become used to, the ease of access, the ability to quickly save and discover things, and continue learning from where you left off, no matter what device you're using. So I wanted to invite up our AVP of product management, Summer Rogers, to help me show exactly how this will work. I love Katy Perry. Thank you. Welcome, Summer. So Summer's going to show us exactly how this experience will work in the system. Great. So thank you for introducing what really is the inspiration that our product team has been working on to reimagine the learner's experience. And today I'm pleased to share with you uh, one of our uh, new product areas, new pages in the system that we refer to as Learner Home. And Learner Home is really uh, motivating two behaviors. We recognize that it's still very important as an organization to help drive the behavior of uh, completing the um, guided training, the assigned training that all of employees have to take in many organizations. So I'd like to share with you the story of Jackie, who is a creative designer. And here on the left side of the screen, we can see that Jackie's already completed many trainings. She has badges. And below, we see she has some subjects that she's interested in. I want to draw your attention to the uh, past due section on this page. Our intention is to surface and, and drive Jackie's behavior to complete the training that's already past due, but give her very easy visibility into what's due soon and maybe what doesn't have a due date. And below at the bottom, if she wants more detail on her training record, she can access her transcript from here. But in addition to helping uh, Jackie complete her assigned training, we really want to enable Jackie to realize her potential through providing a way for her to dis discover self-guided learning. And so let's imagine for a moment it's her first visit to the page. We see here at the banner on the top an invitation to add subjects. And subjects is the first point on this experience that is using um, our opportunity with our machine learning platform and artificial intelligence to present to Jackie subjects she might be interested in. So it's informed by what we know about Jackie and what Jackie has done in the system already. So in this case, let's say Jackie wants to indicate that she is interested in learning more about UX design. As we come back to the learner homepage, you'll notice that the banner changes. We want to offer the organization and the administrators an ability to promote something. So in this example, the organization is maybe promoting their development day and guiding Jackie to click the link to check out the sessions available on development day. So let's explore further what Jackie might be recommended. Again, using the machine learning platform and artificial intelligence, this is a very personal experience for Jackie. Now, before we explore different carousels, I want to call your attention to continue learning. We want to reduce the friction of Jackie uh, selecting and taking training. So from our continue learning carousel, really enabling her to pick up where she left off, whether she was completing assigned training or tra taking learning that she was interested in. As we move down the page, we see a, a banner that is saved for later. If Jackie's on the go, checking out various learnings that are interesting to her, she can go ahead and mark save for later and come back to them and find them here. As we move further down the page, we see some additional carousels. They're really giving her personal recommendations. So top picks for Jackie are learnings that are um, interesting to people like Jackie. And so the system thinks that Jackie might be interested in taking them as well. We also see recommendations 
that are relevant for her position in the organization and that are inspired by the subjects that she's indicated interested in, that she's interested in. And this is important because while, we've, uh, while we have recommendations in the systems today, we are extending that concept to include not just learnings that are uh, taken by people like Jackie, we call this birds of a feather flock together, but when you indicate interest, we now can make recommendations that help Jackie grow in whatever area that she uh, feels is important and relevant for her, for her aspirations. And then we also have a carousel for the most popular learnings that are happening in the system. Now this content is all kinds. It can be long form, it can be external content from the course catalog. It's the whole shebang. Now maybe Jackie knows exactly what she's looking for. So from the learner homepage, Jackie can go ahead and initiate a search. So let's imagine that she's thinking about learning more about design thinking. So if we go to the new learning search page, we see a very familiar experience, a very Netflix-like experience where we have tiles that represent the various content that matches her search criteria. And the few things that I want to call out to you um, is that the engine behind the search is very powerful. It's an elastic search engine, and when she searches for a content title, it's looking at descriptions, keywords, and presenting the results in a relevancy sort order. Now, Jackie's got a meeting coming up quickly, and maybe she only has a few minutes to consider some training on design thinking. So filters are available for her to let her really hone in on what type of learning she wants to take. So if it's micro-learning, she's got under 10 minutes, maybe she can filter by under five minutes and find that right content, that right learning about design thinking. Adam, that Thank concludes you. my ELE demo. Excellent. Thank you, Summer. So it's not just about the discovery that we do using video, like Netflix, but it's also about the curation that we've come to expect from services like Spotify. And when you think about curation, there's multiple ways to curate something. So if you're looking at Spotify, you might have my playlist, which of course is set for Billy Idol for tonight. You have Beth's playlist, which apparently is everybody who's ever performed at Convergence. So we know why those artists were picked. Or you have the Machines playlist, right? These are the top hits, top of the charts, recommendations made based on preferences. And different services use different algorithms. That's why you could subscribe to both Spotify and Pandora, because they actually have different algorithms that result in different music selections. So as you can imagine, when you're talking about learning, and we're talking about opening learning up to everything available out there in the world, there needs to be some way to figure out what you're going to take. And so we need to have a way to help you have a personalized, tailored experience, even though there's so much content out there. Because you often want to learn about a particular topic or subject, or you need to learn for a particular career path or job that you're in currently. So how do you do that? Well, we're introducing Cornerstone Playlists. And Cornerstone Playlists will allow you to attach any kind of learning, whether it's something proprietary from the company or something that's been available online or something that was generated by one of your employees or by the L&D department itself. It could also be third-party content that's connected to the system. All of that becomes up for grabs when you're creating a playlist. And as you can imagine, there could be multiple kinds of playlists. Every employee can create their own playlists for themselves. Managers can create playlists for their employees. Subject matter experts can create playlists 
for anybody that needs to learn that subject. But you could also have playlists from the training department. The L&D team can create curated playlists for different learning paths or different types of subject matter. And, of course, you could have machine-based playlists where the system itself is defining what are the appropriate kinds of training or learning opportunities to help you in a particular area. So these playlists will allow you to capture and discover other people's playlists, to follow playlists from somebody else, to share and like playlists, and also will give you recommendations as you were creating your own. So you might know what you want to put on your playlist, or you might need recommendations. And those recommendations no longer need to be limited to what is officially in your portal. It could be learning that's come from anywhere. And what we intend to do here is leverage the power of 31 million people using Cornerstone's platform. All of them being able to create different playlists, tagging content from anywhere in the world, and making that part of a global repository of learning content that we'll be creating and tagging and allowing to be part of the recommendations that go out to any new playlist created. So when you put these two things together, this idea of Netflix with simple discovery and simple consumption, and tie it to this Spotify concept of curation, you end up with a very compelling learning experience platform. And we're making it part of Cornerstone Learning. It will not be separate. It's not a separate product. It's part of the system. And so, to talk about the impact of this, I want to bring up the person who, in many ways, has defined what's happened in the learning industry over the last many years. And that's Josh Burson. So Josh, I've known you for a long time. You and I have been on this journey together. Yep. In fact, I think we might be the last two people left <laughs> from when we started many years ago. And I know that sometimes you like to stir the pot. That's keep, kind of my job. To, to keep the innovation <laughs> happening. So some people recently reported that you said the LMS is dead. And I think you probably meant that it's time for the LMS to evolve, that we need to move to the next level. So do you think we're, <laughs> you think we're moving in the right direction? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I, I do want to say one thing. You, you guys showed me this new system two weeks ago, and I think this may be the most significant thing you have ever done in the company. I really do. I think it's very big. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm being completely honest about that. <clears throat> and, and here's my experience with this. We've been in this business about the same amount of time. The learning management systems business is about management. Management of content, management of training, management of certificates, programs, curricula, and so forth. And you built a great business doing that. And we all bought those systems and we used them. And then about five or six years ago, <clears throat> people realized, you know what? It's not about the management of learning, it's about the experience of learning. And I want to be able to find a video or share something with another pr uh, person in my company or learn something that's appropriate for my new job or the job I want to get. And the learning management system was never designed for that. And so a bunch of little companies were futzing around with video learning platforms and they basically became a different category of software, which I basically couldn't think of a name for and I called it the learning experience 
systems. And you guys have been buying these things because the learning management system wasn't designed to do that. But learning management didn't go away. So what you've effectively done in the last year or two is built the learning experience platform on top of the learning management system, so now you're able to do both. And I really think you are the only vendor that has done that. And so it's going to be very exciting for you guys. So I, I, my hat's off to you, Adam, really. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> Checks in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you think all of this learning experience platform change is going to affect L&D? Because it's got to affect the people that work in training and development. It, it's, it's, gonna, it's freaking out L&D. OK, let me just say that. Um, so a couple things on that. We are publishing our fifth high impact learning organization research this last month. The net promoter score of L&D is negative 12. So L&D as a profession has had a really hard time keeping up. And it's not for lack of effort. It's for lack of tools and, and really lack of standards. Um, and so what we're finding in my conversations with many, many of you and lots of chief learning officers is that L&D has to go through a transformation and do the same thing. Get out of the process of management and think about the process of experience. So that means you're not a teacher. You might be a producer, a curator, an experience designer. I mean, you have to think about the learning experience in the flow of work now. And that's not where a lot of L&D professionals started. What is it like for a new employee in a bank, for example, to you know, need to find information immediately? They're six months into the job. Where do they look for it? How are they going to find it? Where, you know, what, what is it going to be? What is going to be available to them? And so you have to think about your jobs as really content experience designers and analysts to understand how people are using the system to make it better and better and to develop tools and reward systems so people do share content and they do promote what other people need to learn and they do create a culture of learning. So I think it's actually a huge opportunity for L&D to rise up and take on a whole new role in the organization. So if you were to advise a mid-career L&D professional, which is what many people in this room do today, what would it be? What should they do next? What should they do right now? Get okay. out of the classroom, get out of the corporate university, and go look at what it is like to work in your company and see what the problems are people are experiencing day by day and see how they're learning how to do their jobs better. And get in the middle of that flow and look at all of the little things you can do to improve that experience. So it's coaching, it's time for learning, it's rewards for learning, it's obviously the system, it's sharing of learning, it's many, many other things. And I think your natural skills in the L&D profession will absolutely become important as you go and do that. And that's really what's happened. And that's why these learning experience platforms have become so important, because they enable you to do that. So what else is missing? So now we have learning management and learning experience. What else do you have to do to or do we need to do to transform the way employees are learning? Well, the, big, the, the next big thing, and this, you know, this industry never stops moving, um, is the, role, the impact of AI and technology, as you talked about. And what's happened, and, and um, there's an article I've published that's coming out soon, jobs have changed. And they kind of changed out from, under, from underneath us without us realizing that. And we are now all augmented by technology in our jobs. And so our employees, wherever they are in the sales organization, marketing, customer service, whatever, are finding themselves needing to continuously develop themselves and rethink about what their careers are. And so I think the next sort of shoe to drop in the learning experience, learning management um, market is making sure that the content and the culture and the experience that people um, find at work is not only developmental for where I am today, but getting me to where I know I need to be when I'm not even sure where that is. Because the job that I applied for and went to work you know, in changed when I got there. Right. And it changed the next day. And, and that's a different mode of thinking. And I think some of the traditional ideas of competency models and career paths that we've had with us for decades, they're kind of not enough. We need to go to the next generation. So there's lots of new innovation yet to happen. Excellent. Well, thank you, Josh. Thank you. It was great to see you.
So I agree that AI is a very important component of what else we need. But the other thing we need to really provide a holistic solution is to deal with the content itself. What about the content? Well, there's really three kinds of content out there. There's proprietary content. This is the content that you create. There's open source content. This is all the content that's now available out there in places like YouTube. And there's professional content. And there's many content providers out there making professional content that helps you in certain subject areas. So how can we help in this area? Because I think to have a holistic solution for you, it's learning management <clears throat> and learning experience systems aren't enough. We also have to address the content component. So when you think about proprietary content, it's everything that you're creating. And obviously, there are many different levels of this content. There's very simplistic content, essentially a PowerPoint presentation that you're updating. There's mid-level content, and then there's high-end simulations. And you're creating all different types of content. But sometimes you need more specific content than the budget allows for. So you're forced to create generic content that has broad applicability when really what you might need for your organization, as Josh says, when you're walking around trying to understand what people really need to do their jobs better, well, sometimes that content is too expensive to make. So we want to help you with that. And so we're releasing something we call Cornerstone Streams. It's based on a technology built by SameSurf that allows you to co-browse in your system without any downloads, allows you through Connect to create an instant training course and invite whoever you want to the program, allows for full interactivity, and ultimately will allow for full screencasting that can be recorded right from your desktop and published to your catalog, right through the system. We also want to deal with open source content. And there is a tremendous amount of open source content. It comes from many places. There are many different types of open source content. But the statistics are astounding. 400 hours of video content is added to YouTube every three minutes. 400 hours. It probably takes three minutes to upload it. So basically, it's continuously 400 hours of content being added. So you can imagine, that's just YouTube. That's not the whole internet. So you can imagine that there's an enormous amount of content that's out there in the world. And so, how do you access it? Because some of it's really good. Some of it is ideal content for leadership development. It might be ideal content for that very specialized training that you need. And a lot of it fits right into this world of micro-learning, where people want to learn something very specific in a very short amount of time. So how do you get to that content? How do you add it? to your playlist? How do you make it part of the whole corpus of training that's out there in your organization? Well, one of the ways to do that is going to be the Cornerstone Catalog Connector. What we're effectively doing is leveraging XAPI or TinCan, the newest standards in learning systems to allow you to access content anywhere, to get credit for the article you read or the video you watch outside on the internet, to allow you to add that content to your playlist, whether it's an article, a white paper, a presentation, something you've posted on Connect. It could be 
a video from YouTube or Vimeo, a presentation from ClearSlide or SlideShare, or it could be content was, that was created at a university that's part of a MOOC, or created from a content provider that we're not already integrated with. It's going to open up the entire world of learning to your employees, allowing you to access content from anywhere and add it to your playlist, making it part of that learning experience for the employee. We're also very aware of the fact that formal content is not going away. Formal, professionally built training content is still really important for every organization. Whether you're teaching the basics or getting deep in IT, you have to deal with compliance. You want to teach people basic business skills or help them with leadership development. Content is important. And so we've been working for a long time on aggregating content. But the problem is a lot of the older content that's out there doesn't work, right? Old content doesn't work on mobile. You also now have a very broad spectrum of the kind of content that's available. There's content that's short form that goes down to 90 seconds. That's micro learning. And there's content that's long form that might take weeks or months to complete to get you to a mastery level of a particular area. And all of those different types of content have different completion rates, they have different volumes, and they have different requirements. So we gotta be able to deal with any kind of content that's out there. And obviously, you have this emergence of all of the open source content. So the professional content needs to be better than the open source content. So we've tried to help you with this over the years. We've partnered up with the top e-learning providers around the world. Many of them are here this week. And we've helped you figure out what content's appropriate for particular needs you have. We've helped you understand who to use for what. We've helped you aggregate and purchase the content. But in this modern world of learning experience and open source content, we think it's not enough. We're not doing enough. We're not dealing with how people are consuming content today. So even though there's tens of thousands of content offerings available, there's more we can do. So we understand what learners want, right? Learners want something that is easy to get. They want something that is easy to consume. And they want it easy to find, right? So how do we make it easy for you to get the content that you need. Well, today, along with the announcement of the Learning Experience Platform, we're announcing a new service we're going to offer, which is Cornerstone Content Anytime. It's a subscription-based offering where we're packaging up some of the best modern content out there and making it available to you on a subscription basis. So we're taking some of the best crowdsource content out there from CyberU and some of the newest leadership development content from Power Forward and some of the best thought-provoking content from TED and the largest library of micro-learning from Grovo. And we're combining it together to give you something unique the ability to access something that's subscription-based, with unlimited access, with an ever-expanding catalog that's continuously updated. And yes, it's very familiar. It's how we're buying video today. It's how we're buying audio today. 
This is how we're consuming media today. So we're taking the exact same approach, trying to bring you the best content out there, content that's completely modern, that is giving you what you need, video-based, works on any device, mobile or otherwise, and allows you to have unlimited access to both personal and professional development. And of course, as part of this, we have to make sure that the mobile experience is great. So everything I've shown you in that summer went over is built to be responsive, works on every device. But even that's not enough, because that's table stakes. So in addition to everything being responsive, we're going to be rolling out fully native apps for iOS and Android, specifically focused on the training experience. Totally optimized for perfecting the learner experience from any device. But it's not limited to learning experience. Right? Many of you are in charge of compliance also. And we know, as the largest learning management company in the world, that learning experience matters, but so does compliance. And so we're continuing to invest to improve compliance with things like the Learning Administration Console that we put out earlier this past year, and the Learning Assignment Tool to enable massive batch registration and assignment of training to meet compliance requirements, and the course builder to help you version your content and easily create and load content into the system. And so to talk about the convergence of these two things, of learning experience and compliance, which is still very important to us and to many of you, I wanted to invite up one of our clients who's been at the forefront of meeting some of these compliance requirements, and that's Sarah from UBS. Got that sunshine in my pocket, got that good soul in my feet, I feel that hot blood in my body when it drops, ooh, I can't take my eyes off of it, moving so phenomenally, you more like the way we Hi. work it, Welcome so don't stop. Sarah, everybody knows UBS is one of the preeminent financial service companies in the world, but we don't know much about your workforce. So can you tell you a little bit about the workforce at UBS? Yeah, so, Keep talking. Yeah. so we are 60,000 uh, people around the world in 50 different countries, actually. We're speaking a number of uh, languages. Switzerland itself has four, actually four more official languages, um, four generations, you know, working in the same workplace, so pretty impressive, yeah. And you've had to meet compliance requirements. You're under a lot of scrutiny by regulators to meet those requirements, so how have you used the, the learning system to do that? Yeah, so it's a very good question. I mean, we are part of the financial um, um, industry that has had to evolve a lot during the, the last couple of years, right? Um, and we need to ensure that actually all of us in the bank have a firm grasp about the regulation and the legislation, you know, that, um, that govern our activities and processes. So we have a big, you know, part of the system that is using actually a mandatory training. It can be legal, it can be compliance, but it's also, you know, business conduct or people management, right? So we needed a robust system able to get that and to manage that correctly. Um, Cornerstone was able to do that, and we have actually, in terms of certification and affirmation program that are quite complex because they are using different parameters that are difficult to calculate, even with Excel, and we all know that Excel is really great, right? 
So um, we were really, it was one of the main requirements when we look at the system and Cornerstone was able to do that. Now that we have been live and it's only two months ago, we are working on using the capability of Cornerstone, the framework, to actually simplify all these rules that have been built over the last 20 years in the company. You're very much a global company. You have a lot of people around the world speaking multiple yeah. languages. I imagine the implementation was fairly complex. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the implementation and why you decided to roll out a new system? Yeah, so effectively, I mean, our employee survey in 2016 was actually pretty positive, but it showed that we could do definitively better in terms of uh, learning and development, right? Um, and, and it seemed to us that we were doing a lot. Actually, you mentioned it, right? Learning has been, or Josh has been mentioning it. Learning um, community has been doing a lot in most of the companies. But we felt also that we needed another system to help you know, progress in our ambition. The current system that we had were actually out of uh, end of life. And then comes always the question, do you want to upgrade it or do you want to move ahead from the previous system? So we look at the market, we screen the market. You were the leader, but more importantly, I think we selected Cornerstone for two main things. One was really SaaS that correspond now to our full technological strategy at UBS. The second was that robust platform, I talk about that, but certainly also um, the possibility to, um, to offer innovative feature. Uh, mobile was clearly key for us. Uh, on the job, virtual classroom, um, we were looking also at something about user-generated content and so on. And we felt that we wanted a system that evolved with us, right? So we are pa kind of passionate about that. I didn't necessarily mention it before, but for us, the way we want to deliver value to our customers uh, it's superior value, right? We are in financial services and, and advice. We need to have a, a, work sh a workforce that is actually providing superior services. And to do that, we felt that um, the, the best is certainly to have a purposely uh, intelligent workforce, able to innovate, change, you know, um, and more importantly, access to knowledge and information accurately and purposely. Right, and to do that, I, I think that's why talent and development is key, and having the right tool for them is also key. So we just talked about learning experience and the learning experience platform. You are in a highly regulated industry. It's a yeah. bank that's very focused on compliance, but can you see uses for that at UBS? Usage of... Um, the whole new personalization and consumerization that we've been talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. So we launched actually two months ago, right? And I would say compared to all the deployment of information system, it went really well. So a big thank you to the team. Um, and, and, and the fun part is starting now, actually. Um, everybody who was coming before to me saying, when do we go live, when do we go live, are you sure it's fine, it will be fine? Now are coming up, wow, how interesting it is. And we're already looking at the roadmap for the future. I have also the business, not just traditional HR, but the business coming to me and say, ha, ah, actually you have a nice warehouse, how can we put the product into this new platform, right? So the business is coming to use that to put their own content and that was handled differently, almost in parallel to the HR uh, offering in learning, right? So very interesting uh, to see that. Actually, I took some screenshots because I really believe that when I come back, I can show that and I'm pretty sure that it will be uh, quite inspiring for most of us. Great, well, thank yeah. you for sharing your story. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we think <clears throat> Cornerstone Learning is now an easy choice because effectively you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting both the leading learning management system and a state-of-the-art learning experience platform together as one solution. So learning is great on a standalone basis for an individual. But for an organization, if you really want to get the maximum value, 
you got to tie learning to performance. And when we think about performance, a lot has changed in that space as well. And the reasons aren't great. A lot of people simply aren't satisfied with the way performance management is working today, and the employees are thinking about leaving their job. These stats are pretty dismal, right? 44% of employees thinking about switching employers. Now, that survey was excluding Cornerstone. <laughs> and why? Why do they want to switch? Well, it makes sense, right? We, we're talking about the need to keep being developed in the modern world because jobs are changing, requirements are changing, the competencies you need to be successful are changing, and yet they feel like they're not being developed. Number one reason people are leaving is because they feel like they're not learning anything. They're not developing, they're not getting better at their job, and even ones who are learning something feel like they don't really have control of their career path. And this is what Josh alluded to as well, right? The need to understand career pathing at a different level. And so... Is it time yet? Oh, Carla, not yet. We, we're, we're talking about really connecting learning to the career path of the employee. But the reality is we've had career path and capability for a long time. The way it worked is if you were in HR, you could go into the system and you could indicate what positions were tied to what other positions. Now that's a good idea if you have a company with 25 employees. If you have a company with 25,000 or like some people in the room with a company with 250,000 employees and thousands of positions and therefore hundreds of thousands or millions of permutations of career paths, there's absolutely no way anybody is able to do that. But the machine can. The machine can do it. The machine can automatically figure out what the career path options are for any employee based on the history of the company. So from position A, we've had employees go to position C, F, and Z. And we could even tell you what the expected duration is to get to that next position and what development is required to be prepared for that position. That is the promise of artificial intelligence, to leverage machine learning and big data to help you understand exactly how to tie your learning to your career path aspirations. But when you think about performance management, there's also the issue of how do you actually deliver feedback? How do you deliver performance management? How do you ensure that your employees are doing what they're supposed to be doing and are working in an optimal way? Well, most managers believe that the way they do performance management today is not effective. And so do most of the employees. We talked about a couple of years ago the fact that most employees found that the best feedback they got was from their peers, not from their managers. So how do we help facilitate that? We can handle all types of performance reviews. We can deal with continuous goal management. We can help you give ongoing feedback to the employee. We can even handle structured feedback. But we're moving to a different world. We're moving to a world of agile performance management. Why agile? Because that's a word that's used in development these days, in product development. We no longer do waterfall development. Waterfall development was you would write a very expensive, extensive and expensive requirements document and specification detailing every aspect of what was to be built. That would take a long time to put together. And then that exact thing would be built. And it might take months, it might take years. 
And that's what was delivered. Until people came along with the idea of agile development, with scrum masters and stand-up meetings, and the idea that we were going to build to a sprint every two weeks. And every two weeks, we would reevaluate what we had created, we'd test it out, we'd see if anything needed to change, and we'd keep iterating. Because the problem with Waterfall was it might take you years to build it, and by the time it was done, it wasn't exactly what you wanted. So you'd have to go start again. In Agile, you were able to keep improving, keep iterating on what you're doing. And so that same concept from product development organizations is now moving into the whole company with the idea that all performance management can be agile, that you could have conversations with your employees every two weeks and set new goals because the organization's moving too quickly to set goals once a year. And so Cornerstone Conversations is going to allow you to formalize that process, to document in a structured way feedback that's delivered to the employee on a periodic basis to ensure that the employee and the manager are aligned. But even that's not enough because we're witnessing an engagement crisis. Now, I actually didn't want to show this because I thought the numbers seem so absurd. It sounds like the numbers for the inauguration. <laughs> but this is actually from Gallup. And the good news is that in the US, we're doing much better with employee engagement. Only 68% of our employees are not engaged. Again, this data specifically excludes Cornerstone employees. But <laughs> we're seeing a global crisis around engagement. And when you have a crisis, the first thing you have to do is you have to admit that you have a problem. You have to identify what the issue is. And we want to help you do this. We want to help you understand what's going on in your employee base, what kind of engagement is out there. So we're introducing today Cornerstone Engage. It's already live. It's in production. And Cornerstone Engage is going to allow you to create any kind of engagement survey or cultural assessment to deliver to your employee base at any time to any population. It will take almost no time to configure or deploy, and it's already set up if you're already using Cornerstone. So this creates lots of opportunities, and I want to invite Summer back up to the stage to talk about Cornerstone Engage and exactly how it works. All right, so thank you for having me back. I am very pleased to be showing you today one of our newer products, which is called Engage. So I'm here on the Engage dashboard, and you touched on it quite a bit, but really the purpose of Engage is to measure employee sentiment. And I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what is a very simple tool to use. Um, at the top here on the left, we have actually three dimensions that we want to measure. And a lot of tools out there today just present one score that, rec that gives you visibility into employee sentiment. But for our tool, we really wanted to segment um, three key drivers within the organization, and that's satisfaction. It's important because satisfaction is tied to retention, and engagement is tied to performance, and commitment is tied to an employee's um, organizational citizenship. And that really means to the extent they'll go above and beyond the job profile they have in their role at the organization. And the reason why we did this is because as Engage continues to 
develop with new tools, we really want to think about what actionable uh, tools the Cornerstone platform can enable organizations to react to the findings that they have when they use the Engage tool. So let me tell you more about what we're offering today. Below here, when we're looking at satisfaction, we see a score. And the idea is that an organization over time might have multiple survey campaigns. They might have frequent pulse surveys to really tap in maybe weekly or monthly to how an employee is feeling about their satisfaction in the workplace. Um, it's best practice, while we can look at it weekly, it's best practice to look at this information uh, quarter by quarter. As we move down the page, we also have a heat map. So if I'm looking at the top of an organizational hierarchy, in the heat map, I can see the child divisions that exist. And the green, in, the green tile indicates a generally positive score level, and red indicates a lower score level. And so you might want to dig deeper into why a particular area or group within the organization has a lower sentiment. I'd also want to call your attention to this top organizational area called system administration. It has no scores because there weren't enough respondents. So it's important to know that this tool makes the feedback from the employees in the organization confidential. So unless a certain threshold is hit of respondents, you won't have data to refer to. Next, I'd like to share with you the drivers. So behind this simplified tool is uh, a set of organizational, excuse me, industrial organizational psychologists. It's a mouthful. I practice saying it multiple times. And what they've done is they've designed over 100 questions that are available out of the box to help organizations create surveys that truly measure um, the science behind the satisfaction, the engagement, and the commitment to the organization. But we also allow organizations to add their own questions if they do want to customize their, customize their surveys. So a lot of this uh, predefined template and the science behind it corresponds to drivers. And these drivers are communicating um, to your HR department, your talent leaders, what are the drivers tied to satisfaction for your employees and your organization? And if we click on one of the drivers that is most correlated to satisfaction, in this example, the question, I am familiar with and understand the organization's strategic goals, you can see that with a survey campaign over time, you can watch as you um, observe the employee base improve their understanding of strategic goals and therefore increase their satisfaction score. If we return to the dashboard, there's just one more item I'd like to call your attention to. You can include in your survey some open, free-form questioning. So in this example, we asked, how would you describe your company culture? You can see one-word comments that might have been shared by the employee uh, when completing their survey. Um, but one of the interesting components of, of this particular question is that of all the words communicated by the employees, <coughs> the system will uh, parse that information and really surface what is the most common um, sentiment as it relates to that question, how does your employee uh, think about the culture? In this case, they really focused on the word customer. Now, Adam, this event is you know, a lot of pressure, been preparing a lot of demos. I haven't had a chance to uh, fill in my, my survey, my sentiment. Well, Summer, so, we, didn't, we didn't send out an annual survey. So how did you do that? Well, annual isn't frequent enough, frankly. Um, this needs to be a continuous feedback approach to understanding your employee's sentiment about the organization. So we send surveys on a weekly basis. So here I have my mobile application open, and the survey can be sent via email or can be available in the mobile app today. And today I'm feeling pretty good. I like working under pressure. So I'm going to select the smiley face emoji. And it's asking me how, I, how would I describe our company culture. And I think I'm going to say visionary. And submit, and it all aggregates the information in the Engage tool. So basically, you can do periodic reviews, you can do annual surveys, or you can do pulse surveys anytime you want. Yes. Right from your phone. Exactly. Pretty good. Yeah.
And Summer, what if, what if I'm working with a consulting firm? So I've already been doing engagement surveys. It's nice that you're giving us a bunch of questions to use, but we already have our own specific ones we want to use. So you can add your own questions to the survey. You can use our, um, our questions designed by the IO psychologists, or you can append and define your own questions and tie them to the metrics available, succession, excuse me, satisfaction, engagement, and commitment. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you. We announced this today, but we've actually been doing a beta for this product. And so I want to introduce somebody who's been working on that beta, who's been a participant in that beta, and also is a member of our esteemed client advisory board, and that's Denise from Bonton. I've never seen my name that big, so I'm kind of liking that. So, Denise, tell us a little bit about Bonton. Okay, well, you know what? I see everybody out in the audience here, and they all look fabulous. So, I'm pretty sure they've already been shopping with us, right? Okay, um, Bonton is a regional department store. Um, we're based out of the Northeast, the Midwest, and the Great Plains. Uh, we have 25,000 associates um, in over 250 locations, and um, we are, operate under seven different nameplates, which makes it a little complicated at times. So they are, so I have to hold up my thumbs so I can count them all, um, Bonton, Bergner's, Boston Store, Carson Perry Scott, Elder Beerman, Herberger's, and Yonkers. And so when people ask me and they say, well, I've never heard of your company, I usually say, well, where do you live? And they say, South Dakota. And I say, oh, well, that's Herberger's. So you do know us. Um, we've been in business um, for more than 100 to 150 years in all of those nameplates. And so that's why we've chosen to keep the names. That's great. So you've been using Cornerstone Performance for a while. We Can have. Talk about that. How? Yeah. How it's went? You know, I think that a lot of times when people think about performance, they think about the performance appraisal, the annual appraisal that you mentioned earlier. Um, but we actually utilize performance in a couple different ways as well. Um, we utilize performance to do individual development plans. And uh, what an associate does is they, they actually uh, complete a self-assessment in the system and it then identifies where they feel there are opportunities based on the competencies that we have defined. And from that, they have a conversation with their supervisor. The supervisor can actually see the IDP in the system. HR can also see the IDP in the system, which is great because then we know they're actually being completed. Um, and that uh, then it spurs on a dialogue about what are my opportunities for development? And um, from that, uh, they can actually choose various um, activities or um, articles to read or take a, a, assign themselves a learning module to take um, based on that competency and its opportunity. So it really has become a great tool and a dialogue on how to improve myself and how to develop. So we've considered engage part of the performance suite. Do you think it ties to oh, I performance and talent? I absolutely do, because I think the two go hand in hand. Um, you know, we um, have done surveys in the past uh, using SurveyMonkey, and, um, you know, it is uh, a lot of work. Um, they, um, and, but it actually tells you a lot about what is happening with that associate and where there are opportunities for us to really um, make sure that we are tying in our objectives in the organization to their development and, and the both go hand in hand to make sure that we are being successful. And when's your next survey coming out? So, um, you know, here's the thing. So, 
One of the opportunities that we've had in um, conducting these is, as I said, we've done them on our own, right? And um, it really takes a lot of time in actually taking the information and manipulating the data and reporting it back, right? And um, you know, one of, one of the things that we've done re recently when we've done them, we've only been able to do them with our corporate associates. So, and the reason is because when you have a selling associate that's on the selling floor, the only computer they actually have is the point of sale device, right? So every time we take them off the selling floor, that is, for one hour, that's a quarter of a million dollars. Oh. So it's a big investment in order for us to do engagement surveys, training, and things like those. So um, we're very excited about the ability to get to that associate from a mobile device um, that they can actually, uh, the manager at the store level can have access to the data uh, right off the bat. Um, they actually will be able to see, as Summer showed, um, what the data is telling them. And with our initiatives that we have going on right now to really, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but retailers are having a little bit of a tough time. Yeah, I mean, we talked retailers. about the malls closing, right? Right, So that right. directly impacts a store like Bonton. I mean, you put the A word up there, right? Yeah. The Amazon word. And it's having a big impact on us. So we as an organization are trying to make sure that we kind of tie in to the customer, um, the fact that we are not only a brick and mortar store, but we have online, and we give both options. So we are trying to make this the year of the customer, and in by, by doing that, we, are, we also have to make it the year of the associate, right? And um, we need to make sure that that associate- why, why is that? Because there's a direct correlation between customer satisfaction uh, and employee satisfaction. Right, and uh, you talked about, there's been a lot of talk today here about experience. Right. And um, the two go in hand in hand, so that customer experience and that associate experience are linked. And we want it to obviously improve our business, but it's also important to our talent strategy, right? To make sure that the associate feels a deeper connection to the organization um, that they understand the objectives of what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, the, the, the question that Summer presented up there is, do you understand the bigger strategy of the organization? Um, we want to make sure that we're doing that with that selling associate on the floor because they touch that customer every day. Right. And so they have to be engaged and they have to feel like we're doing a good job for them. And this is going to allow us to do that via a mobile device. So guess what? We don't have to take them off the floor anymore, which is huge. Um, we don't have that, obviously, the monetary investment, um, but we also don't have a logistical investment that is required. Now, you asked me a question. I kind of kept going. So you asked me, when are we going to do this? We're going to start this in a couple weeks. Um, we're going to do our first uh, engagement survey, and it's really going to be tied to uh, what we're trying to accomplish in the organization. And we're going to be taking pulse checks throughout the time of this big initiative that we have um, to really focus on customer conversion. So um, we get a lot of foot traffic in our stores. 70% uh, of our customers come in and don't actually buy anything, which is just heartbreaking. So we are really trying to make sure that we are increasing conversion and we know that that associate on the front lines is key to making sure that happens. So okay. more to come. We'll let you know how it goes. We're super excited about Engage and we really appreciate you launching this and allowing us to be a part of it. So Thank you. All right. And good luck. Thank you. That's all right. So we've talked about the experience of the employee, of the learner, of the manager, but there are a couple of other constituents that you touch as part of your ecosystem, and those are the people you touch in recruiting, right? Cornerstone Recruiting today deals with every aspect of the talent acquisition lifecycle from attracting candidates to helping you select 
the right one to hire and then onboard with tools to manage the entire talent acquisition process throughout. But when we talk about talent acquisition, there's been a lot of growth in usage of the system, almost 400,000 jobs posted, millions of applications submitted through the system, and all the while, we're really touching two key roles here. We're touching the candidate and we're touching the recruiter. So both of them have an experience that needs to be addressed. So when we talk about the candidate experience, the candidates are being bombarded with ads. Candidates are getting ads all the time from all sorts of origins that are attempting to be personalized to that candidate. And when you're recruiting, you're vying for attention across all that noise. So how do you do that? How do you create a really good, meaningful interaction with the candidate? How do you create a really good candidate experience? So when you're talking about redefining recruiting in a consumerized world, the candidate experience really matters because that candidate is a consumer and they're being bombarded with all the same ads that we all are every day. So we're giving you tools to streamline that process, to make it easy for you to have a really good experience for your candidates. And we're very proud of the fact that one of our clients just won the HR Excellence Award for candidate experience. They operate a global restaurant chain that has a continuous need for new employees and they needed a candidate experience that would work perfectly from a mobile phone and that would allow them to get an application in just a few minutes before the person left the store or left that restaurant. So we want to make this a very simplified process for you going forward and have a great candidate experience, but we also want to make sure that you have a great experience for your recruiters because they're the ones day in and day out that need to interact with the candidates. And much like Denise said, the store associates are the ones that touch the customer, the recruiters are the ones that are touching the candidates and ultimately the applicants and your new hires. So you want them to be happy. So for them to be happy, we want to make sure that they're having a really good experience. And that means, first and foremost, they need to know what to do next. When they walk in the door, when they sit down in the morning, what is the first thing they should do? And when they complete that task, what should they do next? Well, the hiring dashboard now tells them exactly what to do next. It shows them all the actions they need to take all the approvals that are waiting on them, all the new submissions that have come in, and gives them the ability to act on it immediately. We also want to make it simple to manage job requisitions. When you're adding a new opening in the organization, how easy is it for them to create that opening, to localize it for the market that you're in for that particular open position? How easy is it to manage jobs that are very similar to one another so you're not starting from scratch each time? Really streamlining that recruiter experience. And at the same time, maybe most importantly, how do you effectively manage the flow of applicants so that you can easily discern which ones to spend time on, which applicants to thoroughly review, which people to bring in to interview, and ultimately, which people to hire. So we're working on totally streamlining and simplifying the entire process to manage the applicants that are coming into the organization. Streamlining the entire talent acquisition process. And so, we want to also make sure that when it comes time to hire somebody, 
you're able to easily connect with other services that are out there to make those final steps, whether we're talking about background checks or drug screens, or we need to do immigration verification or other services, we want to make it easy for you to be able to connect to those services. So Cornerstone Edge has a marketplace now that allows a recruiter or an administrator to easily go in, activate the integration they need, and easily pass information to that provider to streamline the entire hiring process. And we have a lot of clients that have been using recruiting, and we have a lot of clients in many different industries, but one of the ones who've been most successful on the recruiting front is our client, Sanford Health. And so I want to invite Bill up to talk about Sanford's experience. So Bill, talk a little bit about Sanford Health. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. Over the last 10 years, uh, we've been on a pretty fast-paced journey at Sanford. Uh, throughout that time, actually, uh, you guys have been along, ride, along that ride with us. Uh, we started off working with you in learning management. Uh, and that really coincided with really a pivotal moment in our organization's history. Uh, our major benefactor, uh, Mr. Denny Sanford, uh, came alongside and forged a, a critical relationship with our leadership about the exact same time we started uh, our relationship with you. Um, he made a, a, an initial infuse, uh, infusement of uh, about $400 million, then later to $1 billion uh, in our organization. And that really served as a catalyst uh, to take us from, at that time, really a standalone hospital with clinics and a small physician practice group in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to the fully integrated health system that we are today that spans 300,000 square miles, has an integrated health plan, has a research function, has a uh, weight loss management profile uh, is what that's called division uh, and it's really transformed us from about 6,500 employees uh, to where we sit at close to 29,000 employees today. Oh, so that's incredible growth over that period. Yeah we've had a, we've seen a lot of significant change and I'm happy as I sit here today to say that throughout that time uh, not only has Cornerstone grown with us uh, but continued to help push us and take us along on that journey. That's great. So how is uh, Cornerstone recruiting helping you with all your initiatives at Sanford? Cornerstone recruiting uh, is perhaps uh, maybe been most pivotal for us in our relationship. Uh, we've uh, had a great experience with the learning management system, uh, but really at this point in time now, recruiting, uh, as we looked at it this last year, uh, we really saw that as probably our biggest need in the organization. Uh, as we went over the last 10 years, we saw significant growth through mergers and acquisitions, which meant as we came together and looked at ourselves last year, we had four disparate systems, which means you have four disparate processes, policies, and everything else. Um, and as many of our, uh, my colleagues that are here today, what that means for us is that means for uh, the customer, or in our case, the patient, it's a different experience across the footprint. Uh, and we really believe that whether you were coming into one of our major tertiary medical, clinic, med medical centers in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, or Fargo, uh, North Dakota, we want to make sure that that experience is just as positive as if you were to step into one of our small critical access facilities someplace else out on the plains. Um, and for us, we think in order to have an employee base that delivers the same positive employee experience or customer or patient experience in our case again, we believe they need to have that same treatment. They need to experience that same positive experience as both a candidate, as a new hire, and as an employee. And we really believed uh, that recruiting was a way in which we were able to do that. So we went live in November uh, with uh, recruiting and it's been a, a fantastic ride thus far and it's really allowed us to kind of now bring employees into the organization all on the same footing to give them that same employee experience. So you've had pretty incredible results in a relatively short time. Can you share some of what you've experienced? Certainly, and uh, one of my executives, uh, Brad Schoenfelder, that's out here today, he's gonna get nervous because I'm gonna quote numbers. Okay. Uh, so I'll probably average and round up here, <laughs> but uh, uh, all kidding aside, we really have had remarkable results. Uh, we went live in November, um, and as uh, any of the colleagues out here who are in healthcare know, uh, it is a dogfight each and every day for the best and brightest talent out there, especially uh, in areas like nursing, where we know there's a shortage across the country. 
um, and especially where we sit mid, uh, in the Dakotas, where we have some of the lowest unemployment in the country. Um, starting off in November to where we're at to date, uh, we've had an 82% increase uh, in our overall applications. Wow. We've seen an over 60% increase in our unique applications. Uh, and to me, what's most impressive, because those things are all great, but it's really about your final results. Uh, but in the t period of time uh, since we went live in November to where we're at today, we've hired almost as many as we did in the entire year prior. Uh, we've hired, uh, I think that's, uh, I looked at this last month right before, and this is where Brad will get nervous, uh, but we had almost 1,200 hires last month. And for us, when you have 28, 29,000 employees, that's a pretty that's significant a month. Yeah. Before going live uh, with Cornerstone, our biggest month ever was 700. Uh, That's incredible. Was, if we go year over year, we look at about 500 that last month in 2016. So we've had fantastic results. So what's next? You probably want to build on that success. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what is next for us? Uh, really, here in another month, we're going to open up a brand new uh, $500 million medical center in Fargo, North Dakota. It'll be a flagship facility for us and our footprint. It'll be the only level one trauma uh, between really Minneapolis and uh, Denver. So it'll be meeting a critical need in this part of the country. Um, and with Cornerstone at our side, uh, we've been able to fill about six weeks in advance uh, the additional 500 positions that we had to have open. Uh, but as we really look to the future, it's now that we're able to generate the volume and get the traction that we need, it's now getting better. We're looking to quality, making sure that we continue to bring the best and the brightest into this organization. Well, fantastic. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank it's great, you. great success ahead. Thank you. So we've talked about a lot of experiences. We've talked about the learner experience. We talked about the experience for the manager and performance. We talked about the recruiter and the candidate. But what about the poor HR department? What about their experience? Well, unfortunately, the experience has not been very good. You know, core HR historically has been the least experience driven of all of the different areas of technology around HCM. The systems really were built to be about transactions. They weren't built to be about people. And most of the systems were built many years ago before you had these ideas of consumerization and personalization, before you had predictive analytics and artificial intelligence. And so, these systems are not modern, for the most part. And as a result, HR, despite their best efforts, still spends about 60% of their time on administrative tasks. And that's not very effective. It's not a good way to go. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can have a more efficient way of managing HR. So Cornerstone HR is really focused on fixing this problem. And when you think about HR systems, it's really about three areas. It's about HR administration and simplifying all the processes that need to happen. It's about the transactions and the integrations with transaction systems like payroll and benefits, and ideally it's about analytics and making it easy to get the data you need, make sure the data is centralized. So when we talk about HR administration, we really are focused on three things. One is self-service, letting the employee or the manager make the update themselves. Don't call HR, do it yourself. Do it from your phone or your tablet or your computer, but update your address yourself. Change your benefits enrollment yourself. Simplify the processes. Kick off a promotion cycle for an employee yourself. Make it easy for the manager to do their job and make it easy for the employee to get the changes that they need. But it's also about administering Are you the ready records. For me? Uh, soon, very soon. It's also about managing the records. 
of the employee, making it easy to make a change today that will take effect in the future. Make it easy to see an audit trail of every change made to an employee's record. Make it easy to find information about that employee, whether you're talking about their career history or their salary history. And it's about being able to manage the organization. Companies are restructuring and building all the time. Organizations are constantly changing. How do you simply manage that? How do you make it easy to make the updates, to make changes to the organization? That's what Cornerstone HR can help you with. But there's also the integrations to the systems that are out there. So I talked about Edge Marketplace, making it easy to connect your data to other systems. And so we've done deep integrations now with ADP for payroll and benefits and with Kronos for time and attendance management to make it easy to manage those transactions. But it's also about analytics and managing the data in an efficient way, using the data to guide your experience across the organization. Cornerstone Insights helps you with predictive and prescriptive analytics around compliance, around performance, enabling you to surface data in advance to take action. Cornerstone View helps you visualize the data to understand exactly how these tools work together. And Cornerstone Workforce Planning helps you plan for the future, helps you understand what are your headcount needs one year, three years, five years out. It helps you roll that up across the entire global organization. With each manager having allocations of budget or headcount to determine what the workforce looks like in the future. But we don't want to stop there. We think there's one more thing that we're able to do today now that we have over 3,000 clients in almost every geography and in almost every industry. We want to help you benchmark your data. So I want to bring Summer back up to talk about Cornerstone Benchmark. We're going to help you visualize your data and compare your data within the company to other organizations and across your industry. How does your data compare to other companies in your space? And how does your data compare to the universe out there? Summer? Thanks, Adam. So I'd like to share with you today our new product, Cornerstone Benchmark. And what we're looking at here on the Benchmark page it is, is a set of uh, metrics. And out of the box, we're offering a number of metrics that will provide visibility into what's happening in your organization across workforce planning, compliance with on-time completion rates, and metrics about recruiting, like time to fill. And in a moment, we're going to take a look at um, a diversity example, gender mix specifically. With all of our massive data, Benchmark is about enabling our customers to really understand how they compare with organizations in their peer organizations, organizations in their industry. But it's more powerful than that. It's going to allow our customers to compare parts of their organization to one another, we call this internal benchmarking, versus external benchmarking, which is viewing your organization against peers. So as I mentioned, we're going to take a look at gender mix. As we dig into this metric, I'll call your attention to the segments on the page. Um, out of the box, with all of this massive data, we're very quickly serving up your company distribution of gender. And we're looking at uh, the immediate area of uh, your peer or your geography to understand how, in this example, which happens to be a manufacturing company, how your gender mix stacks up to the gender mix of the particular region. And I want to call your attention to the segment called New Segment. If I click onto it, I want to show you how you can slide out a segment and very easily understand um, a few things. 
You can filter by industry, and right now we're looking at all, and we're looking at region and size. We can name our segment. So for my next example, I want to think about uh, how parts of my organization stack up between um, one division versus another. So let's take a look at the logistics division. And um, I mentioned that we're talking about manufacturing as an example. So I'm going to go ahead and look at the number of industries that I have available. And Benchmark is going to offer you visibility into every industry. So even though you might be a manufacturing company, you could compare yourself against a different industry type. So let's se select manufacturing here. And let's go ahead and leave region alone and size. We could look at North America, we're looking at a, a global perspective, or we could drill into an EMEA region as an example. So we'll quickly update that segment. You'll see that it appears here on the page. And now we have visibility to understand that question. What is my gender mix specifically at the logistics division? The overall purpose of this tool is really to make it simple for the leaders in your organization to understand the performance of their organization and to understand how they stack up against their peers. This type of information can really help drive strategic business decisions. Thank you, Adam. That concludes the benchmark demo. Thanks, Summer. Thanks. So when you think about this, the platform today, we really can handle not just the entire employee life cycle, but the reporting and analytics around your organization to really help you optimize what you're doing, whether you're comparing the levels of engagement of your employees to one from one division to another, or you want to understand engagement levels relative to your industry or any other data comparisons, you're able to do it now with Cornerstone Engage and Cornerstone Benchmark. Now, we've talked a lot about the experience of different stakeholders within your company and your ecosystem, but what about your experience? What about the client experience overall? We think it's really important that we're driving a simplified, easy client experience. And we're really on a journey with you. And that journey starts the first time we talk to you and goes hopefully for a very, very long time. So like any good journey, it helps to have a guide. So I want to introduce you to our new guide, Carla. Thanks, Adam, for the introduction. Woo, wow, look at all these people. This is unbelievable. Hey, Carla, what are you doing here today? All of the things we've imagined are starting to come true. I can't wait to show you all the things we're working on. Where'd you get that jacket? Ooh, this jacket? No way, this is my special jacket. I brought it out especially for today, and I want Convergence to be special for you. Well, thanks for coming, Carla. I hope everyone learns a whole bunch. See you later. Carla. <laughs> Carla sounds really familiar. I can't place it. Anybody know somebody that looks like Carla? Anybody here that could join me? Oh, I know who it is. Kirsten. All right. Nice jacket. Thank you. I am not Carla, in case you didn't figure that out. And we've talked so much about all of the amazing product stuff that we're doing and how our products can really drive value for you. But now I want to talk about how you actually make all of those products come alive and work in your environment and really deliver business impact for you. We've been on a journey, a journey about enhancing how we work with you, not only internally, 
for Cornerstone employees, like Denise mentioned, but really for you, our clients. And we believe that both of those journeys intersect. You're here for your people, and we are here for you. So this is just the beginning for us around how we're changing that experience. We all know that the best products don't implement themselves. They don't take care of themselves. In fact, they need love and care and support because they're living, they're breathing. They require people to actually make them do what they need to do. So this is critical in how we view the overall journey because we've talked a lot about products. We are not just a product company. We bring people to the table to provide solutions, integrated solutions across all of our different verticals, products, and we bring a community to help drive value out of all of those solutions because at the end of the day, you're buying solutions to help solve your problem. We wrap all of those products with programs and a community to help you be successful. And we really want it to be easy, positive, and most importantly, fun. This is what we're here to do, is to be fun. And we believe that actually the start to a really great partnership that leads us to a really long journey together is getting the implementation right. We know if we don't get the implementation right, you're never going to get the value and what you need out of the system. So we are launching, many of you have gone through it, but a new experience around how to get you up and running or implementation. And it starts with a strong partnership. And that strong partnership is then really fueled by three key pillars. And this is what we spent the last year reimagining, redesigning, and we're very excited about this new experience. It's called Realize, and it's focused on expert guidance from everyone in this room. We've gathered all of our lessons learned, we've talked to partners, thought leaders, and we've baked that into the expertise that goes into our new methodology. And it's really about bringing an intelligent start, which is all of you knowledge coming into that intelligent start, and agility. One size does not fit all. All of your business requirements, all the things that you need to execute are all different. So one size does not fit all. We're agile and we morph this process to make you successful. And one of the key things we've been working on, I don't know if you noticed the TPS report, but getting data in to Cornerstone has been one of the issues to getting clients up and running very quickly. And we have now completely transformed that process We've brought in new tools and processes to completely remove the TPS experience. And we're excited to be able to launch the experience, but it is just the beginning, just the beginning of our journey to look at everything we're doing end to end and make it different for you and our employees. Thank you, and we look forward to a great journey. So we're obviously excited about what we've done with the products, the innovation that we've had, the new experience we're going to be offering for all of our new clients. But another thing that we're really proud of is our foundation. We started the Cornerstone Foundation in 2010, and we've had a tremendous amount of impact since its creation. We've really been focused on three sectors education, workforce development, and disaster relief. And we've honed in on three core program areas, technology grants, pro bono consulting, and open online learning initiatives. And the impact has been outstanding. Over, 150, uh, over $135 million of impact delivered by the foundation 
training over 130,000 people in the nonprofit sector, delivering over $35 million of software, and providing over 10,000 hours with your help of pro bono HR consulting to nonprofits in need. One of the most effective programs we've had at the foundation has been Disaster Ready. Disaster Ready was created with the kind of crazy idea that we could get all of the NGOs out there in the humanitarian aid world to work together to establish standards and create training for the 250,000 humanitarian aid workers out there in the world. And this has been a very successful program. We've trained over 100,000 of those humanitarian aid workers. And we've, with the help of the top NGOs out there in the world, everyone from the UN and the Red Cross to Save the Children, Oxfam, Catholic Relief, and many, many others, we've managed to deliver training from over 100 different content sources and deliver over 400 different kinds of courses. Now, we're able to do this to help in disasters. And unfortunately, some of the disasters are man-made. So we decided two years ago to start working specifically in Syria to help with the humanitarian aid relief efforts there. And we redid the portal and created content in Arabic specifically to help with Syria. And that's been a very effective program. We've gotten support from some uh, government agencies to really make this effective. But we also, because we're working with so many humanitarian aid organizations around the world, we don't often know who it is that we're helping unless they come back and reach out to us. So it's always great to hear about the impact that Disaster Ready has had. And one of the organizations that's been really touched by Disaster Ready and by the foundation is CFSI. So I want to show you a very short video on their experience. CFSI is a Philippine-based humanitarian organization. Established 36 years ago, at CFSI we have roughly 300 employees, many of whom come from humble backgrounds, have themselves been displaced, have grown up in communities that long experienced either persecution and discrimination or armed conflict. They have committed to serve their own people or people in neighboring countries in Asia with, I must say, little financial reward. One of the things we do at CFSI is to enable them to do better with their own lives and enable them to do better with others. So we try very hard to provide ongoing training for them. That is what led us to Disaster Ready, which has absolutely transformed their learning capacities and our capacities as an organization. Staff members at CFSI talk about the concepts they learned in Disaster Ready all the time and they share the material with the people we serve. If you come from a resource poor environment, which is the case for many of our people, you probably appreciate far more than others that a paper certificate says you have successfully completed a course. I kid you not, CFSI staff members hang their certificates on the wall. They put them in nice frames. They keep them in folders to preserve them as if a cherished possession. Let me tell you a story about one CFSI employee named John Lico. We met John six years ago in an evacuation center after his town was decimated by a horrific flood that killed many people, thousands of people. He was 22 years old, a young father of two, and he had only an elementary school education. After helping John move from an evacuation center back into a temporary shelter, we hired him to do some basic carpentry work. Over time, we got him in a program where he could complete his high school diploma. John has since taken full advantage of every opportunity we have presented to him, working with us in a variety of disaster settings, furthering his education, and responding to the needs of many staff members all over the Philippines. 
When we first met John, he spoke virtually no English. Now he speaks English fairly well, and he, like other staff members, was very excited when we introduced Disaster Ready, and he quickly started taking courses. I should tell you that John does a lot of his study through cell phone, so he can take his courses wherever he is, be it on a bus, in the field, or in the staff house recovering from a long day. He lists each of these courses on his CV and he hangs the certificates proudly in his home so his children and his wife and his siblings can see the progress he's making in his own life. John is a simple man with a great, great heart, a tireless work ethic, and a tremendous appetite for learning. You, Disaster Ready, have given him a renewed sense of dignity and a future that would not have been possible otherwise. Thank you, Disaster Ready. Thank you so very much. So thank you all for being part of this journey with us, for all your help and support, and I hope you're able to get the most out of the next two days. We really try to make this conference about you. Spend your time talking to your peers, networking, go to the sessions where clients are giving tips and tricks about what works and what doesn't work, the challenges they have, things to avoid, how to be successful, and if you need to meet somebody, just ask a Cornerstone employee. If you want to corner one of the industry analysts in the hallway, go ahead and make the most out of the experience. And like Kirsten said, let's make sure as part of this, we also have a lot of fun. So I look forward to seeing you over the next couple of days and especially tonight at Go Field. So thank you all for coming and I hope this is a great experience for all of you.